Okay, hi everybody. Um, so we're now live. Uh, my name is James Deersley. I'm the founder of the Digital Marketing Bureau. And um, welcome to me, my, uh, my first hangout um, with regards uh, real estate technology. And this is the start of a series of about five or six different uh, hangouts that we're going to do over the next um, five or six weeks, um, discovering sort of um, a different technology each week um, where I believe we need to be aware of in the real estate industry uh, into this year. There are some really exciting technologies out there which um, I think a lot of people can be using at the moment to really maximize the marketing of their properties, whether or not you're just a, uh, a normal estate agent or realtor selling resale homes or whether you are a new build developer who is really trying to make their development look and appeal to a different audience and show it in a very different way. Um, so that's what I'm doing. So yeah, like I said, I'm James Deasy. I'm the founder of the Digital Marketing Bureau, but I'm also an independent technology consultant for the property industry, helping uh, developers and real estate agents understand how to use technology to improve sales and customer service and also um, helping staff communicate the message um, out. So I'm, I'm really uh, pleased to be joined today by uh, some great guys, uh, Mike and Ben from uh, Spider Aerial Filming, who are going to talk to us today about using helicopter uh, drones in filming properties. So uh, why don't I just hand over to you guys and just by all means, um, Ben, Mike, introduce yourselves and, and talk a little bit about Spider and what you guys do. Thank you very much, James. My name's Ben Shepherd. I'm the managing director and pilot for Spider, for Spider Aerial Filming. This is Mike Bishop. I'm a Mike uh, Bishop. I'm the wonderful cameraman for Spider Aerial Filming. Uh, I'm graced with Ben's presence every day, so I'll throw <laughs> it back to him. We'll uh, we'll kind of explain what we do in a nutshell, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of it. Yeah, go for it. Right, Spider Aerial Filming operates about six or seven um, multi-copter platforms with cameras, um, primarily for two industries. Firstly is TV production, and uh, secondly is for property um, videos. The reason for that is that um, they have a unique ability to really show off properties uh, to their full potential, whereas generally um, normal photography and video doesn't come close to showing the property in its setting and uh, and and really, um, it's it, yeah, as I say, it's full potential. Um, in TV production, uh, obviously, we put cameras in places uh, many other things can't reach. It's new technology. It's exciting, um, and uh, and it's very fast moving. So it's something that we're very pleased to be uh, right at the beginning of. Absolutely. I mean, it's something which I sort of saw probably um, about two years ago, I suppose, uh, and it was something absolutely, utterly and uh, unique. It showed properties completely, utterly differently, but it seemed to me that there was sort of only one or two people um, really doing it, um, and that I mean globally. Uh, I don't. I still don't think there's an awful lot of people in the UK doing it. Am I? Am I right in that? What we believe, certain. This was certainly true three months ago is that there are around 150 uh, operators with a CAA permission for aerial work in the UK at present. Um, in order to get that, you, well, you need a CAA permission for aerial work in order to commercially operate unmanned aircraft in the UK uh, for valuable consideration, they call it, so, you know, for, for money. Um, so there aren't many, but it's something that looks very attractive, and I do believe that there are lots of people certainly trying to do it um, and potentially realizing uh, that it's not as easy as it looks. But uh, I, I, do, I think it's something that we're all going to see an awful lot more of in the future. Even in the last few months, if you sit and watch the television, you see them filming adverts, you see them actually as part of the advert, certainly I've seen in car commercials, and something people are using to really give an edge to, to footage now. Well, I don't know what that was, it's going buzz buzz. Um, but I mean, it certainly, do you know what, it, it, it does give that unique feature. I mean, what I was going to do as well is, I mean, you've introduced yourselves here a little bit, but I think there's, there could be some realtors out here who are going to be watching this and actually don't understand necessarily what, what a helicopter drone is all about. I mean, I think there's there's negative connotations where we hear, where we hear the, the US politics talking about drone bombing in, in Iraq or wherever it may be, but what we don't realize is actually, A, what a, a drone is and from a commercial application, you know, let's talk about the, the nice bit of, of what a helicopter drone is. I mean, what are they? Have you got it? Well, you've obviously got a few to show. Of course, we do. Well, 
if you bear with us, we'll just take you up to I got you. that there. That's number one. That yep. is a hexacopter. That is called a DJI S800 hexacopter. Hexacopter as it has six motors. Um, we have, if we move that way, that's an octocopter with eight engines, which can lift a much larger payload, i.e. for us is purely larger cameras. Um, and then we have on the wall there, we have quad rotors or quadcopters, uh, which are very fast, agile, and can fly GoPro cameras around. Uh, we can fly them indoors. Recently, we flew one uh, through, through the drawing room and library of, of Highclere Castle. Um, so wow. they're, 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 ex they're extremely um, versatile things. Uh, military connotations, nobody likes. Uh, no. These, these multi-rotors here, as far as we know, aren't particularly used for anything like that. The military drones are normally gas turbine powered, very large aircraft uh, for carrying munitions. These are, are, are uh, much less intimidating. Some, you could, if you, you think that you could use anything for negative means, you could put a machine gun on a car. Um, you know, I think that, uh, that the positive uses of these are, are going to far outweigh anything that any um, malicious people might do with them. I couldn't agree more. I um I saw today on uh, I can't even remember where I saw it. I think it was one of the Google Plus communities. There was a uh, a hel helicopter drone which was used for military purposes, and it was literally the size of a car. I mean, it's quite frightening even just looking at the thing. But um, let's go away from that because you know what? It's a horrible horrible connotation to it. But let's talk about the uses of, of the um, of the drones for a second because um, I understand that um, Amazon are looking at using these drones. Um, uh, considerably. Obviously there was a suggestion that 80% of their parcels could be delivered by these drones. Um, so that's a, that's one application of it. I mean, come on, is that possible? I mean, these are all GPS located, right? So they can fly to a GPS point anywhere. So is that conceivable? I, I think I'll take that one. Uh, <laughs> I think it, uh, it's, it's conceivable, but it, it, you would never be able to put it to use. Basically, I mean, in the U.S., you're going to have a lot of people that get the packages down, from my perspective. <laughs> you know, you'd have the UAV with, with the package on it, and people would probably make a whole criminal organization amongst grabbing them out of the sky and bringing them down. Uh, so, so, do you know, I never, ever thought about that. So you're saying that basically when they come into the land, they drop the package off. People would literally ransack a, uh, a drone, and then they'll keep it for themselves. Yeah, I mean, you have to think about landing and safety. Um, they would have to have their own flight paths, um, things of that sort, you know, things that you don't think about, you know, because we have our own area of operation that's up to 400 feet. So then yep. we have four hundred up to 400 feet, and then there's 100 feet between us and light aircraft at 500 feet. So they would have to find a different place. That's just in the UK. The US hasn't come out with their rules yet. That looks to be 2015. Um, okay. If I if I can just um, interject and, and say the re the realities of this of one of these aircraft flying to your door with a package, um, bearing in mind the individuality of every house, especially if you take our um, situation here, James. Does it it knows a GPS point? But the thing doesn't know that there might be a six-inch puddle underneath where it's going to land and drop yeah. your new um, computer RAM into that puddle and plop, and then off it goes. It might not know that you haven't weeded recently and that there's a tree overhanging where it's going to come down. <laughs> I mean, th those are just the small, yeah. small practicalities of it. Uh, to, to get over the large practicalities of numerous drones flying around in the sky, uh, which have potential to go wrong. Um, I don't know. I personally think it, it couldn't happen. Well, I'll tell you, it's, it's fun because I, I saw this, and, and my, first, my first reaction to it was, do you know what, using helicopter drone filming and real estate marketing, that's like a no-brainer compared to, to that concept. Um, but I also, I thought it was quite nice because I, I thought, well, hang on a second, if you've got the likes of Amazon, and also since that, um, and I don't know whether they're jumping on the bandwagon or, or what, but you've also got... Uh, DHL, UPS have also all come out saying, hey, this is in our business plan too. Amazon aren't unique. 
Um, it was just, and I can't for the for the life of me remember the guy's name who runs Amazon, but he's seen as a, as a retail guru. He's seen as a very forward thinker. And look, do you know what? It might not happen in a month's time, but he's like, Within five years' time, this is what we want to be doing. We want to be using drones to drop off all packages. I think he wants to sound to something at like 5.5 pounds. Um, and he said 80% of Amazon's business could be done, if it works, by drones. And regardless of the connotations, the negative, the, the positive, whatever, for me, it's just the visionary perspective to look at it and say, hey, anything's possible with these things. So let's move away from that for a second, because I think it's a bit pie in the sky thinking. But you, you've shown us some of the copters you've got behind us. Um, I presume you're using them for different things. I presume some of the big copters you're using for much heavy-duty camera work, um, perhaps uh, they have more um, stability to them. They probably warrant the stability. Um, so could you just give us some uh, idea of the wider application of the various copters that you've got, perhaps examples of where you've used them, um, to give people an idea of, of what you're doing with them? From a real estate point of view, um, which is what this is about, uh, the octocopter wouldn't really serve many purposes. Um, it's designed to lift cameras up to, or camera systems, up to seven or eight kilos, uh, which are cinematic cameras, which uh, I don't see having a use uh, for what we're, we're talking about. However, the aircraft behind us, you can see on the shelves, the pair of them there, um, those are the main workhorse for real estate. They fly a very good HD camera uh, with a high bit rate to get some some very good quality video. Uh, we have flown those indoors. Um, they're quite intimidating when you stand next to it indoors. However, you have to know what you're doing. Um, and we, we've done a lot of training with this. We've flown it through golf club lounges and out of uh, their French windows and up over the 18th green. Uh, as I say, we've, uh, well, from, from the, the bigger perspective, we've flown them in a barn, around the barn, and back out of the door and up to uh, 400 feet in one uncut shot. Uh, so you can connect the inside of a property with its situation within seconds, which is a, a wonderfully unique ability. Uh, the quadrotors, as I said, I, I recently flew one through the inside of High Clear Castle for Lord and Countess Carnarvon, which was very exciting, slightly nerve-wracking. No, but but those, can, those can get into uh, really small spaces um, and but carry a shot through smoothly from the inside to the outside uh, where we can't take the larger aircraft because of, cause of you know, size problems. Yeah, it's it's a real shame because one of the things I was um I was hoping to do, but I I very quickly realised I I can't do for this show was actually to bring on some of your content that you've um that you've you've shot some of the real estate um photos, which is a real shame because actually there are copyright infringements I can't um go into to put one of your videos, even though you own the video, within this hangout to show everybody what you're doing. Um, which is a real shame. I mean, what we'll do is we'll we'll be able to post a link to some of your um, your videos afterwards, where people can see what you're talking about. Especially the barn one. I think the barn one's very interesting because one. I think that one of the challenges for people to understand these helicopter drones is that yeah, of course you can combine inside and outside. I think there's a a thought that you can only shoot the outside of a property and up to 400 feet, as you said, uh, Ben earlier. But what you're saying is that you have got the ability to Use is it the hexacopter, which is the one? The larger behind? one, yes. Yeah, and then you could combine it with using perhaps a quadrocopter inside. Is that is that fair to say? And then you could actually cut it together, or in one succinct shot, actually use a quadrocopter. If the weather perhaps is okay outside and there's not too much wind, do it out. Or is that fair to say? Am I going in the right line? Yes. No, that that's fair to say. We can cut the footage of. Uh, quadcopter and hexacopter together, you wouldn't know which one it was filmed off. Um, ideally, we'd like to use the hexacopter for all of it if the uh, opening in the building is big enough for us to fly through. Um, but the, what you wouldn't want to do is to fly the hexacopter around indoors because it doesn't have the maneuverability actually in a room um, to get a really nice movement shot, it wouldn't fly far enough. Where with the quadcopter, we can actually fly with with a pan motion and get a really nice moving shot inside a room um, or, and through a doorway into the next room. You know, a single doorway that a person, you know, just a single person-sized doorway as opposed to French doors, uh, which would be needed for the larger one. Um, so, but but yes, it, it's seamless. 
no matter which one you fly it with. Yeah. Okay. Uh, having said that, the the quad copters aren't as good outside. And and why is that? Is that is that simply to do with the the weight of the quad copters? Are they more susceptible to uh, the wind? Which is what I think I'm. I think I'm correct in saying. Is that is that fair or? That that would be fair to say. However, the uh, the larger aircraft have more functionality. They have a proper three-axis gimbal. So, we, although uh, if you you look at the camera up there, we have roll like this. We have tilt down and tilt up. But the third axis is pan to move the camera around in a panning motion. Now we can do that independently of the aircraft's motion on the hexacopter, which might controls, but on the quadcopters, any pan motion has to be done, uh, certainly at the moment, to keep them light on the your control of the actual aircraft itself. So as the pilot, in order to have any panning uh, motion on the film, I would have to input rudder to get that panning motion, and it's not as smooth to do that as it would be uh, for the control that Mike has over, over the pan axis yeah. on the Just on the an example, so yeah. you can show what rudder is, Ben. Okay, so that's that's roll axis. Yep. That's the tilt axis, down, up and down, and that's pan. So there is no pan axis on this small one with the GoPro on the quadcopter. I have to move the aircraft like that, um, and flying in small spaces makes that more difficult. Uh, Whereas, if Mike can uh, just show an example on the hexacopter, if we can see up there. Yeah, it's, it's looking pretty good, sir. This is the pan. That's the pan motion, which Mike can control independently. And it just makes for a much nicer shot. I see. So, yeah, okay. So, you, you're actually you're, you're cutting out some of the stability issues with the, uh, with the smaller one, where you're not doing too much flying, which would then... Manipulate the the shot. I suppose is is, is the best way of, of putting that. So, is that that's obviously the reason why there's, there's the two of you, right? So, if I'm correct, then um, Ben, you're doing the the manoeuvring of the uh, of the quadcopter or hexacopter, or are you doing the filming? What, it, there's one of you doing each, right? That's right. I'm I I'm the pilot, so I fly the aircraft and I fly it with. Certainly, of um, well, firstly, the, the the overall view is safety. Um, and secondly, to get a good shot. But for me, it's all about flying the aircraft in the space that I have. Whereas Mike's uh, whole goal is to get a nice shot. Um, so I have my own camera on board with a head-up display telling me all of the aircraft systems um, and my battery condition and where it is. Uh, all, all from a safety point of view, because safety is extremely important to us. Uh, Mike, on his head-up display, has the camera information um, telling him whether it's recording or not, and the camera settings. So it's, it's very much a two-man operation. We, we couldn't do it as a single man. Yeah, and I'm generally, I'll work with either the producer, uh, if it's a real estate agent, we'll have the real estate agent with us, and they'll have a, a screen, so they see the same thing that I see. So they can give us input whether or not they want us to go higher, lower, you know, you know, through this area. So they get they can see exactly what the camera's seeing. It's really useful. We have found. Yeah, that's great because I, I mean, one of the applications that I can see, especially in in say the overseas real estate market, and, and I I say overseas simply because that's where I can imagine the beautiful long golden beaches which are bathed in sun, which at the moment, quite frankly, looking at the UK market, we ain't going to see that for a long time. Um, but looking at the overseas market for a second. Um, you've got this concept of going along a beach and as you're streaming down the beach you can actually move inland to actually see the overseas uh, development there right in front of you so I suppose the real estate agent, the realtor can actually look on a screen as you are flying it to make sure you're getting the right picture um, that's what you're talking about with having a separate monitor for them to see, is that that's right? Correct. That, that's absolutely correct um, on my monitor I, 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 um, I, I fly the aircraft Mike has his monitor for filming and we have a third monitor for the client uh, or the director so the realtor could stand there um, and and tell us exactly what they're after so if they want that lovely Miami Vice style shot where we we run at 40 miles an hour across the top of the sea at two feet off the sea stream across the beach and then up over the property 
um, they can tell us exactly what they like, and all of that's easily achievable. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the things I think is, is unbelievably advantageous from having the helicopter drone flying, because one of the things that I feel about with, uh, with the real estate marketing is that it, it was so called. I was, I was recently a judge at the um, Sunday Times Awards for the property market, and we had one of the speakers on there, and, and I was judging the social media award, so I understood what he was talking about when he said that everything is becoming more visual. The market in property is becoming more visual. Photos have come of age, but 2013 has been the year of the video in the real estate market. But what I still feel about within the real estate market is I, I, I hope that what you guys are doing, you're like two steps ahead of everybody, because what realtors are doing in the UK, or let's call them the state agents in the UK, sorry, um, we've still got this concept of having a static camera being on a rotation, showing perhaps beautiful footage, but from one angle, from the corner of the room to make the room look big. But what I think is the advantage here is exactly what uh, you've just said there, Ben, which is suddenly if you're using helicopter filming, you're not talking about hiring a great big proper helicopter. You're talking about hiring you guys to be able to get shots which you would never ever conceivably get from the ground. Um, and if you've got that monitor in front of you looking at what uh, what you can see, I mean, it, it's, it's breathtaking. I've seen some of the footage from going along beaches and going into developments, going around the developments within it, all in one succinct shot. It's beautiful. This is... This is something that I have to say I've struggled to understand as, as to why the take-up is only just coming now. People have been using videos to advertise their cars, uh, toasters, uh, any items that you get out there, and yet for large estates, people are, are only just cottoning onto the fact that this tool is just amazing for showing off the property in its whole beauty. The, the sh obviously, it's moving, so the shot's constantly dynamic. You're seeing a different part of the property every second. And not just the property itself as we go up higher, you see the property in its setting. And where you have uh, static cameras or photography with wide-angle lenses, which can be slightly misleading sometimes, you don't get the fact that perhaps this um, that the developer is struggling to get over the fact that this development is so close to a beautiful village or, or a shopping center or, or the road network and you can't all you will get in a brochure is a picture of perhaps the road or the village but there's no connection you can't see where it is but from our point of view we can go across the lawn over the house and then tilt up and then you'll see the village and you'll see it exactly where it is in relation to the house and, and if it's a good thing then that, that that's a fantastic thing to be able to get across yeah I couldn't I couldn't agree more I mean it when when people see what you guys have done already I mean I think they'll, they'll take that for you know they'll, they'll understand it a little bit more which is you know just going over that tree line to show the beautiful sort of uh, scenery beyond I mean it, it's, it's mesmerizing and I think it's it's certainly something which on the, on the larger, what I would call the resale properties, so the, the manor estates, the larger houses, when they have got wonderful grounds, they have wonderful properties to show off, um, it is an absolute no-brainer to, to just do something a little bit different. But then, Well, so, sorry, sorry to interrupt there. Another thing that, um, that takes it another step further is, yes, you have beautiful moving shots, but you actually make it into a production with music. And what this... What this does for um, a property is gives it emotion. So you're not just looking at a brochure, you're having movement, you're having music. It, it adds class and feeling and emotion to what you're seeing and just does generate for a potential buyer an attachment to that property. It, it, it gives it a real feeling. So it, it's lovely when we put these together to lovely music. It, it's something really pleasurable to watch. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite emotive, isn't it? It's one of those things. But, but what we sort of talked about so far is um, uh, the, the resale market, the large estates and everything. But I also think there's a, there's a really big market here in the, in the property development world. And um, I, mean, I suppose just talking about it, almost um, brainstorming here, which is you've got the real estate market, you've got off-plan property developments which aren't even built yet. Uh, one of the things that I see as, as being a real advantage for uh, this sort of filming is when you bolt a piece of land, um, it, might be near a, it might be near the seaside, it might be on a beautiful patch of land by the river, it might be in an urban area. What you've also got the ability to be able to do is actually 
put the investor, the stakeholder, the potential um, first phase buyers in a position to see that site exactly where it is location based. And not only that, to sort of sell the land to anybody, but you've also got the ability to go back um, almost every six months into, let's say, a three year build or a five year build to immediately. Um, within a two minute video is actually show the progress of that build over time. So rather than taking lots of little still images which don't really portray the scale of the development, what you can do is you can tell the story of that development as it's growing every six months, every three months, every month, whatever it may be, simply by using the, the drones to go in. Now one question I, I, I had on that is, as I understand it, we mentioned GPS um, earlier on, these helicopter drones have GPS um, tracking in there. So you could literally say, I want you to fly to this um, latitude, longitude, and go and find it. And then you can send them back there again. Is that is that fair to say? Is that right? Correct, yep. Yeah. yeah, the GPS systems are fairly good um, up to, is it a meter? It's a single meter, isn't it? I believe it's yeah. between one and two meters. Yeah, and, and it, that's very, very accurate. We've only come into a few companies that actually want pinpoint accuracy, and that's for graphing and things like that. Um, but the systems that we currently run, it's available, but we just don't have a need for it because the market's not asking for it. Um, but for that type of application, we could go back to that same point um, requested by the client and uh, fly that point every, you know, like you said, in, in every two months or three months or six months and then compile them. And it's just engaging the customer or the client in, in you know, connecting with the build and, and the whole project as a whole. So the GPS, yeah, we, I mean, we can, we can lock in on repeated occasions with, with a meter accuracy, so really, really well. Yeah. No, that's great because, I mean, at the moment in, in the off-plan industry, what, what you would generally find is... Uh, you'll get the uh, you'll get the developer climbing up the top of a train of a crane to take photos, and that and that is their aerial photography. So the scope of using something like this as a helicopter drone to fly around the, the resort, whether it be built or not, the potential is is huge. And what I really like about it is the ability, like uh, like you've said, of you know, property developers are so, uh, development is so large, and they've got little intricate corners sometimes. And to be able to maneuver the helicopter through, you know, coasting through the area, down the path, um, into the swimming pool, through the swimming pool, into the gymnasium, um, through into the development, into a villa where the garden is, you know, it really. And I think, I mean, Ben, you touched on it absolutely. It's emotive. It's it's a it's a dynamic movie, and that's what's so exciting about it. I think and. Um, I think it's it's a great industry there, but I just wanted to move on to another uh, sort of a, a question which has been going on in my brain, which is we're talking about maybe developments here, but what about the difference in filming perhaps on a single unit or in the countryside versus when you're in the middle of a city? I mean, are there restrictions that you're under, and the, how difficult is it? Well, filming in the countryside is an awful lot more uh, free. We don't have we don't have uh, half as many restrictions. The the main rule is there is a weight limit around seven kilos. Now, sub seven kilo aircraft are allowed within um, certain other rules to fly within congested areas, whereas over seven kilo aircraft can't be over or within 150 meters of a congested area. So that large octocopter there with a big cinematic camera, we'd have problems flying in congested areas. We'd need to make sure that it was clear of any members of the public or somebody who wasn't um, under our control. Whereas with the sub seven kilo aircraft, we can be within 50 meters of uncontrolled people um, because, because it's um, so much less likely to cause damage or large damage if, if there was an issue. Um, so flying in cities is perfectly possible with the sub seven kilo aircraft, which the two hexacopters behind us are. Um, but it needs more planning and you're not as free to fly far and high, not so, not so much of a problem, but far away because you don't know what you're going to be over. If you're filming a hundred 150 acre estate with a large um, mansion in the middle of it, we can go 500 meters away from where we are and then just fly right over the top of it to 500 meters the other side, so a whole one kilometer run of 400 feet and get a massive view of it. 
uh, which we wouldn't be able to do in a city. That's a, actually, you, you bring up a good question there because how, what, is, what are the range of these copters? So we, we've mentioned that there's 400 foot and then there's 100 foot until you get to the light aircraft, but what about sort of the, the radius and the diameter around of which you can stand? How, how far can you fly away? The, the lead, well, physically, our radio systems are probably good for a kilometer away from where the pilot is, um, and they could go as high as the battery will stand uh, until per perhaps if you have an amazing battery, you get to thin air, uh, it, it would, uh, or thinner air, it would slow down its ascent. But uh, legally, we're allowed 400 feet high and 500 meters in any direction from the pilot. So that's a very large bubble, and which is obviously you know, a, a kilometer in diameter. So we, we have a big range there. Um, that, and that would stand true for the city if you knew that there was nobody in that one kilometre range, which quite obviously there will be, so that, that's why it's so much more constricting in the city. Yeah, because that must be quite difficult. I mean, in, in a city, if the legality says that you, you've got to be within 50 kilometres of a, I can't remember the term you used, um, a non-controlled person, was that what it was? No, 50, 50 kilometres, 50 metres. 50 um, metres, sorry. Yeah, no. What am I um, talking about? <laughs> You can't fly over or within 50 metres of people that are not under the control of the pilot in command is the terminology. So if everyone within that 50 metre radius has been briefed and they're part of the operation and they, they understand what's happened in, in the event of any uh, problems or emergencies, that's fine. Uh, what you can't have is, is people who don't know what's going on or who might wander into harm's way within that 50 metre radius. If you you have an incursion into that area, then you should move the aircraft away um, until somebody has managed to, uh, you know, make it all safe again. Yeah, so it's quite it's quite difficult then, really, isn't it? Because in a city, I mean, it's like I can't even remember the statistic about rats and mice. You're only six foot away from a rat in London or something. Um, I mean, pretty sure if you've got a central London development, if I'm right, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that in theory you could probably quite easily just send a helicopter drone straight up directly up, film around, and you're probably just about okay to be within 50 metres, not kilometres, 50 metres from people. Uh, the problem is going to be if you start flying around, which is if you go to the outer edges of a development where you could be near a road or you could be near people. Is that right? Am I, am I right there? Yes, that's correct. Flying straight up over a patch of ground that we have control over, such as a development, is no problem. What we can't do is fly right to the edge of that patch of ground in, you know, in case we have a problem and the aircraft might fall out of the zone that we have under our control and potentially uh, cause damage outside that. So we can fly around within that area, but the, the main reason for these rules are just to make the operators think, is it safe? Um, and if you're in central London and you're the aircraft can uh, can cover 10 meters extremely quickly, so that 50 meters buys us time to um, you know to to execute an emergency procedure to make sure that everything stays safe. These things are safe as long as they are well maintained and you fly them safely and you think about things and plan things through. So what we what we've just done basically is ruined the entire Amazon uh UB, uh, UB, uh UBS DHL uh, business plan right there and then is what we're trying to say there's no way they could ever conceivably deliver to London or Birmingham or Manchester or Liverpool or anywhere like that we've done well we've done well <laughs> <laughs> i don't i certainly don't want to um uh, to, to rain on the parade of new technology and the things they might do um, yeah. who am i to think about what technology of sea and avoid or parachutes or uh, inflatable bubbles that pop up around the aircraft that just bounces harmlessly down the road if it falls out of the sky. I have absolutely no idea. Um, I'm sure they'll do very well when they come up with those plans. Yeah, I, I can imagine. But I tell you, the only shame about this sort of stuff is because, I mean, there, there's so many ideas that you can have with helicopter drones. I mean, one of my things as well is that when you're selling a house, you're also selling a lifestyle. You're selling a, a way to live. Um, and I... I can imagine actually filming along a beach as the sun is rising. That's probably not going to be too difficult because there's not going to be many people walking along the beach at that time. Um, so that's probably quite easy to film. But let's say you are a London property developer trying to sell an unbelievable development off of Park Lane, Mayfair. You know, probably one of the most um, in-demand areas of London, and you're trying to sell it to the Chinese or the Far Eastern developer um, clients, you want them to know just how cool that place is, how wonderful Park Lane is, how 
big the houses are around there. And what we're saying is, you know, you can't go down Oxford Street. You can't go down the middle of Park Lane to show just the area because it, it's restrictive. So that is very sadly a limitation. If, if well, I, I, have, I have to say anything is possible and you can fly down Park Lane if you get Park Lane shut and you get permission from that borough council in yeah. order to do it. Everything's possible, but it probably costs an awful lot of money and be very hard work. There, there are also restricted uh, areas of restricted airspace um, in central London, um, certainly around Hyde Park, I believe, City Airport, and, and one other, um, where you have to have very special permission to fly, which we can ask the CAA for, and, it, and if it's a good enough reason and uh, it's thought through and safely planned, then they might grant us permission. But uh, as I say, anything's possible. It's just the amount of effort and perhaps money that needs to be put into it to achieve it. Well, yeah, well, they, they, these guys do have an awful lot of money, so it's, uh, it, it, I wouldn't be surprised yeah. sometimes if they, if they wanted to shut Park Lane. I'd love to see it. That would be quite a unique <laughs> thing. But well, we'd love actually, to fly down it if they shut it. It would be brilliant fun. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine you would. But there's one thing I was going to ask, because you, you brought it up there, the CAA. So just for people who are not aware, I presume that's a Civil Aviation Authority? Correct? That's correct. Yeah. Okay, fine. And I presume... Um, it sort of leads on to my next question, which is, I mean, you said there's not many of you out there um, who are actually um, legally allowed to fly. I mean, arguably, there, there are people buying these little tiny quadcopters like this big. Um, but when it gets into the serious thing, I, are there restrictions on people owning helicopter drone uh, drones for commercial use? W what are the well, restrictions there? No, not, not owning, no. But if you go out and fly that aircraft for what they term as valuable consideration, so money or um, perhaps uh, goods in return, then you need to have a CAA permission for aerial work. Uh, in order to get that, you need a, a recognized qualification. I believe the only one at the moment um, is the BNUC S from Euro USC, uh, European Unmanned Systems Center. You go and do a ground school. Then you complete a flight test where your aircraft's uh, inspected, um, and you prove your competency. And then, um, with their um, authority or help, they suggest to the CAA that you are eligible for a permission for aerial work. Okay, so even before you get to the CAA stage, you've got to be looking at your qualifications to actually um, to to be able to fly these things. That's what. Well, I, yeah, yes. I believe that if you had, uh, if you approach the CAA and you have some other kind of qualification, perhaps or I haven't heard of, or extensive experience, and the CAA are happy with that, then then um, then maybe that's okay. But we know that uh, if you do this BNUC S qualification from Euro USC, then that is um, a, the the best way I believe to get your CAA permission for aerial work. And I mean, obviously, that that's we're talking about the UK here specifically. I mean, I I presume the restrictions are different depending on which country you're in. So I would imagine the US has completely and utterly different rules and regulations for helicopter drone flying than, than we do in the UK. I mean, do you know anything about that um, or, or not? For the US, uh, they just they just approved six sites uh, in the US for testing of basically the theory, my understanding of it, um, for drone flying for commercial use. Um, agriculture is huge in the US as everyone knows. So that seems to be the biggest industry and the biggest focus is the agricultural focus. Um, you cannot fly for, for commercial gain there um, for commercial purposes. There are a lot of operators flying, but as far as I know, they're just starting to get training programs in. So these would be you know, technically hobbyists that buy the same kit or similar kit to what, what you can buy out there, similar to that behind us, um, and go out there and do it, you know, uh, kind of below board black market type of style. Uh, but that it's all being looked at right now for review, and then 2015 looks like the target date for the FAA to certify actual operators, but there's so much red tape to get through in the U.S., it's, it's going to be difficult. And that's the FAA's the Federal Aviation Authority, I think, if, if memory serves me correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fine. So basically, actually, for a change, we're, we're actually ahead of the game a little bit. Well, maybe not, as the case may be. We're probably too too bureaucratic. But um, no, I right, it's, I probably, would, it's for the safety, though, right? It's, it's, I it's would have to say, yeah. I'd have to say that we are lucky 
to be in the UK as uh, unmanned aircraft operators at the moment. Um, the UK CAA is is um, is well forward thinking on this. I believe that we have a lot of freedom to operate in the UK um, as long as everybody's sensible and continues to do that. I believe the CAA will look after us. Uh, we have flown abroad. We we flew in France. Um, and we are, as far as we know, the only UK operator to get proper permission from the French authority, the DGAC, um, in order to fly unmanned aircraft in France. It was quite, it was quite a, an ordeal getting those permissions, but we managed it and the French were very kind to let us do it. They have their own rules, but uh, this is, it's accelerating so fast, this industry. I think we'll see a lot of aviation authorities in more advanced countries having to have uh, departments to look after this in order to control what is quite a boom in unmanned aviation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm i just imagining the French for a minute, and I'm just imagining the great big French chateaus and, and, uh, and flying unmanned aircraft around there. I mean, the footage you could get from a a huge French chateau with the land and the and the gardens and oh it must be absolutely stunning I would it think. Would be, it would be beautiful and we know uh, that it is certainly possible because we've been there and we've done that and the, the French CAA uh, know of us now so I believe that that would be fine. They, they, they were very kind and gave us permissions to fly in Evian les bains which is on the shores of Lake Geneva uh, which is they consider a congested area. They let us fly there uh, for the Gulf and uh, stunning scenery with the mountains behind. Uh, France is an amazing country with loads to offer um, for, for realtors and for, for this kind of filming. Okay, well, let's, let, let's ask that question. I mean, let's, let's assume that, um, that uh, realtors come to you and say, hey, guys, look, um, uh, or a, a property developer. I've got this amazing property development uh, in Liverpool. How do they go about um, getting... Um, a helicopter drone flying around the development. Do they have to go through a procedural thing? Do, do we do you have to apply for permission to fly around there? How how does that work? What's the procedure involved to get you guys in? Um, what they would have to do, being well, assuming that they were already the landowner, we need landowners' permission um, in order to fly over an area. We have, as, as I've already mentioned, our UK CAA permissions to fly. So with the landowner's permission and with our CAA permissions, we could go ahead and do it after having done a, a, a risk of safe assessment or a safety assessment on the area to make to see what um, airspace, etc., it was in. They would just need to call to call us or to, or to call another operator. Um, and say that they would like to do this, we'd do the safety checks, see that it's all alright and then just arrange the date in which to go and do the filming. Um, and, and possibly seeing as, as the developer would have an idea of what they wanted out of this production, then we'd get them to ask or, or, or to get them to start thinking about what they would like to see out of the shots. We'd like yeah. this particular development connected to the shopping mall a couple of miles down the road um, or we particularly want to show off the fact that it has a nice uh, swimming pool complex at the back of it and, and so we can get creative on our ideas about how we can do it and make the most of our time there. Yeah, I mean that, that's certainly something which um, which I've found with, with these property developers. I mean I, I generally get brought on to say, right James, how, how can we use technology to market our development? And a lot of the times it's the first question is, well, actually what do you want to do? Who are you, who are you trying to pitch to? Which market are you trying to pitch to? What sort of client are you trying to pitch to? Because arguably, and I guess I'm, I'm right in saying this, uh, let's say you're filming to a younger market. You would make the, um, the music over the top completely different. You would probably make the cutting of the edit completely different. And so that really comes down to that first meeting that you have with the client and determining who they're pitching to, where they're pitching to, and what they're wanting to get out of it. That's fair to say, isn't it? Correct. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we, we, when we do, that's something that we provide. Um, I haven't seen a lot of operators that provide the same service. It's fine, Sam. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen a lot of operators that provide the same service where we'll film and then produce a video and you know really work with the client to hone it in for for their client, um, for for their clientele or target group. Um, so yeah, it's 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 just incredible technology to get listed with these guys. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? It's, it's was just what you want to do, really. So, and actually, the only the, the only other question I, I sort of wanted to go down really was was nighttime. Um, 
I know that obviously there's a lot of developments out here as well, which, hey, do you know what? They look lovely in the daytime. They look really wonderful. And as a sort of in the past, we always used to send all of our um, photographers out to go and get early morning photos or sunset photos. But sometimes we would try and look at um, filming developments at light because they might have really thought the outside lighting particularly you know, well through so that it really showed the swimming pools off very, very well or you know, suddenly you've got the nightscape of, of the city um, with all the lights and the spectacular scenery of a city in, at night time. Is it okay to fly at night? Is it, is it under the same jurisdiction? Does it work the same? How does it all pull together? Um, it, as a CAA authorised operator, we can apply for uh, a special permission to fly at night. Um, I don't believe it's something that's difficult to obtain. We just have to show um, a, a, a special safety case to show that we've thought through um, any potential problems that might pop up whilst flying in the dark. Um, it's not particularly difficult to fly the aircraft at night. It, they have LEDs on them and they're very, very well visible. Uh, we switch um, camera settings to a nice nighttime setting um, and can get some absolutely beautiful shots at night of city lights um, and once again connecting it with its, se with its setting at night time. So it's still, you still have to jump through a little bit of a hoop, which is you have to have the approval of the CAA to say, yes, we want to do this at night time. Yes, there, there's a little hoop there, but that's for us to jump through and not the uh, developer. It's not something that yeah. they'd need to worry about. If that's what they wanted to do, they'd ask us to do it, and we would be happy to do that. Any idea on time frame? I mean, that, actually, that's a very fair question. Let's say on day one someone approaches you and says, we want to film. I mean, how long... Is there a waiting period in terms of, of getting approval through, or is it pretty seamless where if the weather's great tomorrow, you can go and you can get it done? Well, that depends on how busy we are. Um, we, we would always like to be, um, to be informed of any, of any shoots well in advance, um, firstly because should the case arise where we need any spe special permissions uh, to fly either in the day or in the night time, we'd like to give the CAA lots of time in order to reply uh, to our application rather than uh, load it all on them at the last minute and then hassle them for an answer. So uh, we always like to be well organized. So I would say if there was a, a case where we needed to apply for any special permissions, we'd certainly like to know a month in advance. Um, should any last minute um, requests come up and we have availability and there is no special requirements, which the majority of the time in the UK uh, on a development there probably wouldn't be, um, certainly if it's outside of central London, and we were free the next day and it was sunny, then we could just go ahead and do it once we'd done our safety case, which again is just something that we would do in the office um, uh, and check the area out to be safe. That would be fine. Yeah, you've just got to, you've got to go through the procedure side, haven't you, just make sure that you, you've covered your own self, so that, that, that doesn't make sense. Okay, well, look, I mean, we're coming to the last of the, the sections of this. I mean, one of the things I always like to finish off, I, I never like to finish on a positive, you see, I, I always like to finish on a, on a negative. Uh, I, <laughs> I always think it's the best way to finish off a, uh, off a hangout, but, I mean, obviously, I have to ask, I mean, all we've talked about is the upside of this. I mean, the upside of helicopter drone filming with real estate is absolutely significant, and I think most of the developers out there need to understand how they can use it. But what are the limitations? I mean, there must be some limitation that you struggle with that is difficult with this technology. There always is. So you know, what is it? That, tell me. Well, I think, I think we've been through all of this, to be honest. Um, uh, and uh, you might like to finish on a negative, but I'm going to tell you <laughs> that everything is possible. So even, as you say, the, the, only, the only worry would be um, central London uh, built-up areas. Uh, but as I say, we all know that everything is possible. With good planning, I don't think there are any negatives to it, as long as all of the people that are doing this do it safely, think it through, um, and make sure that uh, our industry retains a good name for, for professionalism. So, no, I think that it's a glowing one. I tell you what, you can't sell the benefits more than that. But I tell you, the reason I asked that question, because um, one of the hangouts we've got coming out, um, talking about this series of, of, of how we're going in with, uh, with um, real estate and technology, is one of the things that we're going to be looking at is Google Glass and other wearable technology. And one of the biggest problems that we have there, and this is going to be a consistent theme in the future in terms of using technology, how small it's getting, and um, is, is battery life. 
Um, take Google Glass, which obviously is like this with a little video camera here, which is um, taking people away from looking at their tablets and, and actually focusing on what's a point of view side of, of videos and photos and other fancy stuff, which I won't go into here. But the battery life of a Google Glass is, is 14 to 20 minutes. It's nothing. And then it takes another half an hour to charge it back up again. So yeah. I was sort of lining you guys up to say, well, the battery life could be a bit of an issue, but we have 7,000 <laughs> batteries. <laughs> this, is, this is the solution. So this is the solution that helps us fly all day. We, we noticed that we had the issue right away. Um, right away when we started this, we started to run low on batteries throughout the day. So we spent thousands and thousands of pounds on more batteries. So that, that, that issue has been taken care of. Battery life runs about nine minutes on the, on the batteries we run. Wow, but nine minutes. Yeah, yeah. Nine minutes with, depending on how far the aircraft is from us, about a, uh, a one-minute battery change, and we have capabilities of charging multiple batteries at once. Battery life may have been an issue in the past, but it certainly isn't now. We could, we could fly all day um, up to the safe limits of the pilot's concentration. I was going to say, I'm just, I'm just madly trying to count behind you and just see exactly how many batteries you've got. You must have about 30 batteries there. which I mean, just by 23, so you're talking, what's that, 20 times 9, so that's 180 minutes. I mean, that's like, what, five, six hours of battery life. So there you go. Look, see, I finish on a negative based on turning it around to making it a positive because you guys know exactly what you're doing, so it's always a bit of uh, fun. Well, I would say anyone that can sift through six hours of video footage <laughs> uh, would prefer that they didn't have all of that and, uh, and on a positive, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can get all the right shots in a very small amount of time. What a, what a great excuse for a client to say, look, do you know, I, I would really love to have that final shot, which I think you really want, but I don't really want, but the batteries have gone. Oh, it's such a shame. I'm terribly sorry about that. Uh, we're never <laughs> going to give that excuse to a client. No, no way. That's terrible. No, exactly, exactly. Well, look, uh, Ben, Mike, uh, from Sp Spider Aerial Filming, look, guys, thanks ever so much for joining me. It's been a great time. and. Um, I've really enjoyed, I, I now know my difference between my octocopter, hexacopter, quadcopter. Uh, I feel like I've gone back to school trying to remember hexagons and, and, and all those sorts of stuff. So it's, it's been a real, uh, real eye-opener and um, uh, you know, I just want to thank you. And, uh, and I know obviously that um, you do some work with real estate as well as I do. So I look forward to working with you in the future and talk on some um, real estate projects. I think it's a very, very uh, exciting world out there. So I just wanted to say, look, thanks guys and good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. And uh, we look forward to doing lots of exciting work uh, on lots of beautiful properties. Absolutely. Well, look, I'm just going to uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop the broadcast. You guys stay on. It just stops it from the live feed, and then we'll, uh, we'll see each other in a minute. Sounds All great. Right, thanks, thanks, everybody. Um, look Bye, forward everybody. To, the, uh, to the next... Um, next series of Hangouts that we're going to do. There's another four coming on, um, all talking about everything from Google Glass, um, using Google Cl uh, Plus, using augmented reality, using virtual reality, all um, in an aim to educate you about how to use technology in the real estate industry um, to help you sell more properties and to give your customers a even greater experience. So um, I hope you'll join me for all of those. Thanks, everyone. See you later.